All right, so I'm recording at this point, um, and essentially what we're gonna talk about first is this notion of space. And space is, plays a role in um, the elements and principles of design that ultimately, let me just minimize that, sorry, getting set up here, um, ultimately that can render an image believable in space, but also um, can make something appear more three-dimensional. Um, but it doesn't always happen to be um, the use of illusion, okay? So going over just a few terms, uh, I'm not gonna read this all out to you, but a few sort of vocabulary terms that I'll be using today. We'll be talking about focal point, which is generally where your eye is led immediately. Uh, we'll be talking about foreground, which is something that ultimately appears closest to you versus the background, which appears to be in the far distance. We'll be talking about positive space, which is an area of the composition that fe feels filled um, or volumetric. And then negative space, sorry about the um, misspelling there, negative space is the empty space, the open air, okay? So just a repetition here, picture plane, whenever I say the word picture plane and you look further down there, I'm referring to the two-dimensional work itself. So if you're working and you're making a drawing, that refers to the paper. So it's the flat area of the surface that you're working on, okay? You can define your picture plane by creating a border or it just simply can be the end of your edges, right? An abstract obviously is, is um, something that is kind of unknown to the world. You can slightly make it out. Um, it is different than the world around you, but it is from it. And then non-objective means that you cannot in any way make, shape or form make it out at all. Um, it does not look for, like a human experience. So in talking about the picture plane, so the frontal plane of a painting or a drawing, something two-dimensional, um, it differs from something that you're familiar with, which is the three-dimensional world, which is what you're wor working and moving through, okay? So artwork that doesn't really apply to two-dimensional um, design is, you know, ceramics, jewelry, metalwork, weaving, sculpture, and architecture. However, in architecture, what we can do is we can transcribe that space onto a two-dimensional plane through the use of um, linear technical perspective. So you can actually transform the picture plane to produce the illusion of that space itself. And that's what we refer to as linear perspective. It ultimately leads to the illusion of space and what it is is a, and here's the thing, I hate math, hate it, hate it, hate it. Um, but linear technical perspective really does kind of rely on a mathematical system in order to create that, that illusion in a believable way. So it is essentially a system that has actually been around since the ancient Greeks. And then in the Renaissance, which translated actually means rebirth, and it's the rebirth, rebirth of classical learning. In the Renaissance, they rediscovered linear perspective from the Greeks, right? Because it's a rebirth of those, those models and those ideas. So we still use that today. Um, it looks complicated, but it is actually fairly simple. Um, one point perspective is something that most of you probably already know if, you can, if you're capable of drawing a box. And basically it presumes that everything on your eye level will fall to one single place in, um, on that horizon line. Um, unless you see the corner of it where it would actually fall into two places. Those two places in this illustration are called vanishing points. Then we have um, three point perspective, which is generally when you're drawing something that is a, like a very, very, very tall building. So a worm's view from the bottom or a bird's view from the top itself. So there's one point perspective, two point perspective, which are very simple, and then three point perspective. We won't be talking about those today at length though. Relating to the illusion of space though, we have what's called atmospheric perspective. And atmospheric perspective tells you three things. What is in the distance is going to be lesser in contrast, so not as dark. It will be hazy and slightly out of focus. And it will be um, bluer, cooler in color. And we'll talk a little bit about color theory next time. 
Aerial perspective can also be used for that term. So we can go back and forth between atmospheric perspective and aerial perspective. It basically is just suggesting the haze um, that, I, that I just illustrated for you. It's lighter, it's blurrier, and it generally gets a little bluer in, in, um, in, as it moves away from you into the background. Then we have what's known as architectural perspective. And obviously it's not terribly different than linear perspective. Um, it allows us to, re it's really just used for buildings, right? And it's broken, broken up in terms of um, planes and blocks. And it, for the most part, um, is rendered by um, architects or modelers in order to um, d describe usually one or two point perspective so that it's readable by many audiences. A term I'd like you to learn, uh, it's a term that we also use in drawing, is called diminution. And basically, it's the same idea of aerial perspective um, or even just atmospheric perspective. It means that things gradually appear lighter and less defined as they go further away in the, in the distance. So diminution. But diminution doesn't generally refer to the color change. And you'll notice in this painting, this is a painting by Gustave Caillabat done in the 19th century in Paris. You'll notice that the, even the buildings get a little bluer in space and the, the edge is sort of lost and blurry. That is diminution. The same thing happens to the people in the far distance. Look at this guy's legs way back here versus this guy's legs, lower in contrast and hazy. So it's the same sort of thing, just three terms that describe sort of the subtleties of those differences. One other way to describe the illusion of space is to use something called vertical location. Basically, that means you're sort of hovering above, right? So it's a scene that depicts an open space, um, usually incorporating architecture, that, that where your, van your viewpoint is actually elevated. It sort of appears as though you're on a ladder looking down at the scene. This tends to work really well because it's very easy to depict a lot of a scene while moving far back into the distance. And it usually incorporates um, one or two point perspective. So as in this image here, we see a bunch of people and they are not terribly big in the foreground, even though they're closer to us than this. So you see that the, the vanishing point, not the vanishing point, the, um, the eye line is right in the center of the picture plane and the people closest to us are very, very big and the people furthest away are very, very small versus the vertical location where the eye line is actually way up here and we're looking down on these people and they're not terribly bigger as they get closer to you. So this is another example of vertical location. Um, it's fairly simple. Um, there's not a huge distortion in the people uh, getting closer to us in terms of their scale. However, when you create a design out of all similar shapes, whenever you create smaller versions of that shape, the viewer is automatically gonna assume that they are further away from you. And so the largest objects will appear closer. So these are all the exact same um, shape, but obviously different sizes. So that's suggesting space very effectively. Alternately though, when you have completely disparate objects, they're all different. The smallest objects do not generally read like they are in the distance. You see how this image looks really quite flat. All these things kind of look like they're at the same level. Uh, they could be on a window maybe. Um, so when you are trying to make an effective use of depth or illusionistic space, you wanna think about how like objects will appear as though they're moving into space provided they are similar in shape, they just get smaller. Flat objects are terribly difficult to define in spatial proximity. Um, the general rule of thumb um, is actually to stack them. So, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So putting this red box maybe stacked in front of this black box would have allowed me to define the space and their relationship to each other. If I just simply do this and there's negative space in between them, I'm just simply creating um, a flat space. 
So if you use actual linear perspectives, so you see the box renderings here, this can oftentimes create a nice dynamic composition and kind of take care of that problem of illusion for you. Then we have a term called foreshortening. It's a very common term, in, especially in photography, film, and drawing. Basically, that means that anything close to you is going to be huge, and it's got, not going to make a lot of sense, um, but it is what our eyes do naturally in the world. So this image here is actually a kite. So the fish is a kite or a flag, and it's meant to suggest that we are very, very close to that giant fish, but it's not actually a giant fish that's going to eat uh, the whole landscape here. It's just a kite that is ultimately our scale, but because it's close to us, it occupies a good deal of the picture plane, right? Foreshortening. If I were to take my hand and put it near the camera uh, on our zoom, the, the punch of my hand would look enormous and it would obscure most of my face. That is foreshortening. So we have another example of um, foreshortening here. It's a watercolor done by um, Charles DeMuth, um, an American. So our uh, trapeze artist is about to jump and he is very, very large, occupying a third of the picture plane versus the people who are furthest away. Very simple. So that brings us to scale and proportion. Um, when you play with scale, um, and not necessarily foreshortening, so don't confuse the two, um, the example here I'm showing is Ron Muick, and he is a sculptor who's still working today. He used to work for Jim Henson in the Muppet um, world, and he creates these hyper-realistic latex sculptures that are enormous, that look exactly like inc incredibly naturalistic and representational images. So because these are huge sculptures, you interact with them very differently as if you were to act with a sculpture that was actually a man's, you know, an actual man's scale, right? So because of this three-dimensional pre presence, um, the feeling of novelty is really reinforced and the feeling of distortion happens. So uh, on the right there, I've got an example of um, a proportion dealing with uh, the woman on the left, which is in all actuality, within all actuality, her actual representation. So that's a photograph that has been un, um, unaltered. The image on the right is altered to appear um, more like a Barbie doll. And so even though the image on the right in all actuality is kind of impossible, especially with that waistline, um, we tend to make sense of it because it relates to our own personal scale and proportion in the world. Oops, sorry. Hierarchical scale does not actually reinforce the idea of illusion, but what it does is it tells us who's important in the image. So here we have, um, uh, in, in Christian iconography, we have God the Father, we have the Holy Spirit, we have Jesus, man, and then we have the Mother Virgin, um, and they're all on the same plane. So Jesus as man is on the same plane as Mother Virgin, However, um, the Father and the Holy Spirit are higher up. And so this artist has maintained, this is a, this is a middle, medieval image um, done by Lorenzo Monaco, right? Um, is telling us where we need to look and ultimately who is more important than the others. Um, ideologically, in terms of religion, you know, that may not be necessarily where you sit, but the image is telling us that's what we need to think. So we have an incorrect perspectival image here. What's wrong with it? What should happen? Anybody? Um, the closer that he is to us, he should be bigger. Yeah. So this image should probably be reversed, shouldn't it? These three people? Yeah. yeah. And in fact, I would probably make him a heck of a lot bigger. I would make him be as tall as this wall here, and then I would make him up here. So we... So getting this wrong um, can not only happen when we're dealing with architectural space, like we've got here, which defines how big our, our people should be, um, but organic objects do matter. If you're trying to create the illusion of space, organic objects should not be ignored. Leave, you know, a tree um, branch in front of you should be pretty darn gigantic 
Which brings us to amplified perspective. Sorry, the number there is not right. Um, amplified for perspective is basically um, foreshortening, essentially. It's not necessarily coming at you. It just means whatever's closest to you is incredibly dramatically big, right? Um, foreshortening can be used. Um, but it generally yields a very, very effective composition in that it puts you in the scene, right? So it, 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 it tends to be a very um, exciting image to look at because you're in the space itself, um, in your mind's eye. Then I have juxtaposition on there. A lot of people, man, that is a cliche word that people love to use in art school. I roll my eyes every time I hear it. So please don't be that person, but you need to know the meaning of it. Juxtaposition basically means that when you're taking one thing that is different than another and you're placing them in the same space, right? So here we've got when one, image, when one image or shape is placed next to or in comparison to another image or shape. So different things. So what is juxtaposition in this case? The very, very large flowers in the foreground juxtaposed against the very small one in the background or juxtaposed against the sky with the clouds, right? Those are two disparate things. So this image is not terribly effective at actually telling us anything about space. It looks flat. It looks kind of unintelligible in terms of these objects' relationship to each other. And they could just simply be placed on a plane of, of glass. However, when you overlap, you get a suggestion of space and scale. So when you set up a still life, use overlap as a means to define how deep your space actually is. Then we have two new terms called opened and closed form. Closed form doesn't have any negative space within it. So this is an example of a closed form. Um, and generally we'll see that um, both in 2D and 3D art. Um, here we've got a 3D right? So we can't put our finger in any open space here. And then open space or open form always has negative shape in it. So you can put your finger. So if this were an open form, um, maybe the arm would be uh, more relaxed and there would be a hole opening between the baby's bottom and the arm there, right? So what we've got here is we've got a lot of closed forms. Um, this is an open form because there's a negative space, but this shape here, this man, is a closed form. And you see what happens when closed form happens. It, it ultimately creates in your mind's eye a flat shape versus a more dynamic shape like this one that is an open form. So Noticing the sort of difference between these elements here is really important in terms of actually establishing our relationship to the shapes themselves and thus the space. What we've got here in this image is a really practical application of the stacking of space. So what we have here in the foreground that defines it as a foreground is the, the rug there. We have linear technical perspective telling us about the tile work on the floor, and they all converge to one space here on the horizon line. So if you follow my cursor back, all these converge to one single point, and it's about here. And what's interesting about this linear technical perspective and the vanishing point of this space ending here is it tells us what our focal point is. All that space leads to her, and she is having an interaction with him. And this is actually a, a summer shower, so it's a rainy day inside an interior. So what we're meant to actually care about is this narrative that is going on between these two people. He's relaxed. He's sort of creating a C-shape around her. There is a dark space in between them, a negative space, which is a very pregnant space in terms of narrative right? There's a little sexual chemistry or sexual tension between, between the two of them. They're looking at each other. It tells us implied line. And then we have this huge plane of a wall with an opening. And an opening in a representational space is called a vignette, essentially. It's a frame. It's a frame within a frame. And so behind this plane, within this vignette, 
we have a whole other scene. We have a man pouring some, I don't know, lemonade. We have a woman tending to her needlework. Then we have yet again another vignette, a picture within a picture of a window of a couple meeting each other out in the rain. So we have this incredibly stacked space that actually suggests both abstractly and literally where we should be paying attention, okay? And it's all done through the elements and principles of design and creating an illusion of space. Isn't that great? Um, so scale and variety also play a large part in how distance is perceived. So what do I mean by variety? We have all the same shapes here, but we have a variety of actual suggestion of tones um, or textures in this case, if you want to think of them as textures. This one is much more effective at showcasing space and depth than this one is because there is not a variety in the actual, sh the sizes of the blocks themselves, right? So variety can be the surface description or the tone, meaning the value of it, but it can also be the scale of the subject itself. So I just have another il illustration of a Persian miniature. Um, these, you should Google it because these are really beautiful um, objects to kind of behold and see how they're made. But ultimately the perspective is from afar. And I believe I showed you that a little earlier, so I probably should have deleted that slide. All right. Conflicting perspectives can be used and read effectively with simplified context. What does that mean? Well, you can have the wrong object sizes in relationship to each other, but still create the illusion of depth provided they're in a recognizable field, right? We know we're in a kitchen here. We know we've got a table. We've seen this before because it's our breakfast. Hopefully you're not drinking Coke for breakfast or beer, but you get me. Um, we have a sort of domestic scene and because it's been simplified and sort of flattened, we can understand where they are in proximity to each other. And we've simply done that through the placement on the page, even though the scale of each thing is actually kind of wrong. And the perspective is really quite wrong as well. Um, ultimately though, when we do this in accordance to the actual um, shapes themselves, and we align ourselves to the rules of illusionistic depth, like atmospheric perspective or stacking in this case, we get a really more, a much more believable space. Obviously this is gonna be believable because it's a photograph. When we reduce the size of the elements, we suggest space. We can also use value as a means to tell people how to read an object as well. Um, the artist here is using darkness in order to suggest the movement back into space. Here we have a very flat, um, very influenced by Japanese uh, line uh, or Japanese woodblock print here done by Mary Cassatt. And Mary Cassatt was an American living in, um, living in France, in Paris. And here we've got um, a print, right? And it's very influenced by the flatness of Japanese printmaking. So here you see this wall, this perspective that is actually incorrect, right? Um, and it's flattened by this pattern that looks like it's just stamped, right? It doesn't actually follow the rules of linear technical perspective. However, because of the use of stacking, because of her shape in front of her shape, dark in front of light in front of light, or a more flattened shape, we understand that we're meant to look at, um, at this as a space. So there are a handful of ways to create illusionistic space. Um, these are just six of them. The first is through overlap. The second is through shading or value, right? Uh, shading refers to the more subtle version of value, of adding value. Placement, how far objects are away from each other. The scale of those objects themselves. The value and the focus, so something like aerial perspective or atmospheric perspective. So the value and focus, they get lighter as they move away, they get hazier too. And then linear perspective or linear technical perspective um, as a means to use hard lines to create a vanishing point on a horizon line. And we'll learn about that a little bit later on. Any questions so far? Okay. This is a very, very famous mural done by Paolo Uccello right at the beginning of the Renaissance. This is done on a sort of like administrative uh, uh, 
administrative wall in a municipal building. So it's still up today, um, and it's still actually a municipal, municipal building today in Florence. And it depicts the, you know, the Battle of San Romano, which is, um, wasn't probably, uh, well, it was pretty epic, but ultimately the, um, the, the commissioner, so the patron of the actual mural, is depicted as leading the charge. And there are all sorts of inaccuracies here in terms of the actual description of space. Um, you slightly suggest linear technical perspective, but the, for the most part, the entire space is, is actually defined by the use of stacking and value. Here we see an Ed Ruscha print, um, and these are very fairly famous at this point, um, using the use of uh, using um, linear perspective as a way to create a dynamic composition. See that really hard, almost bisection, this diagonal bisection of an image um, that reinforces the sort of excitement of the picture plane itself. And then we have a sort of standard um, high up uh, 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 um, horizon line in this one where we're not really playing with scale, but we're playing with the sort of spatial relationships between the subject matter. And then we have a more traditional view of perspective in this Roger van der Weyden, um, St. Luke drawing the Virgin and Child. So the perspective here in this van der Weyden image is pretty awkward. However, it is still correct as one point perspective. And one point perspective can be used in anything. Um, here we have a graphic design use in a poster. Uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Danish Jews flight to Sweden. Um, it was done in 1993. Um, so ultimately that perspective is meant to elicit or suggest a road, right? Or train tracks, um, hopefully not train tracks, but more like a way forward, right? We're moving forward. So linear technical perspective here becomes a metaphor to the star of David, which is of course em the emblem of the Jewish people. We have a very simple uh, representation of a palazzo in Rome um, it, it depicted in a photograph uh, where linear technical perspective is just sim simply one point. And then when we have two point perspective, we actually see the corner generally of something. So over here would be the corner of this building and this building. And so the horizon line is down here and all the uh, points converge to one point on the horizon line, which is a little over here. And then these converge all over to one point, which is off of the picture plane. So two point perspective when we see two points creating vanishing points. And there we see it illustrated. This is a painting done by a guy named Felix de la Concha. Uh, it's an oil on canvas. So he's playing with extreme one point, uh, actually this is two point perspective here. And then of course, contemporary artists use this as well to create flat, flat spaces that suggest or toy with the notion of space. And this is Sarah Morris. We'll actually be doing a project based on her a little bit later. So multi-point perspective um, is, is not in reality how we actually move through the world, but it can be used in order to create a dynamic feeling of space. This um, George Tooker image, it's a very famous image. He just died a few years ago. Um, creates multiple perspectives, so uses more than two vanishing points. It's not three-point perspective, but it can be really disorienting because it's not actually accurate, but it still conforms to the rules of linear perspective. Generally, I don't advise uh, beginning students to use this, but it can be used to great effect. Foreshortening can also create unease or tension. So we see this man sitting on this bean chair, and up close to us are his gnarly, gnarly feet with his toes poking through his slippers there right at our face, right? So this kind of can be very confrontational. So know that before you use that. When you look above something, uh, or sorry, when you are above something and you're looking down on it in a picture plane, like in this particular image here, you're suggesting a hierarchy that you are better than or that you can conquer or have conquered the viewpoint. So know that there can be suggested metaphors with viewpoint as well. Not sure why I included these, but the Egyptians would often, well, I do. The Egyptians would play with perspective in a way that um, kind of mirrored their aesthetic values. 
So if you ever look at the representation of figures in ancient Egypt, what you'll see is a very flat representation that has a lot of open form, so a lot of negative space. But things, <clears throat> excuse me, things like uh, the eyes would be actually depicted as if they were in front of your face. So if the viewer, if the subject were actually looking at you versus the side, which is actually how you see. So this is a side view of an eye and this is the front view of an eye. And the ancient Egyptians will actually depict it as is if you're seeing the front of the eye. And they would do this because it reinforced the notion of their, um, of their aesthetic values. So their, their, their idea of perfection. And if you're, you're representing someone in, perf in perfect form, according to your culture's defining parameters of that, they will be reborn right, because that's their religion, they will be reborn into the afterlife perfect as well. Here we have a project done by a guy named David Hockney. I'll show David Hockney a lot, where he took a series of photographs, and so these are all individual photographs that he would take from one single point in space. So here he's looking at uh, a bridge, right? And he's photographing it a 100 times here, and then he prints them all out and puts them all together in order to create this sort of um, fisheye. And a fisheye lens, of course, can be put on a, on a camera. However, you can essentially suggest this by forming just uh, multiple images from one particular place in space. So we call that monocular form of view, which means there's one eye. Here we have a correct, um, a correct uh, cube in space. And then, of course, the incorrect cube in space when we don't quite get perspective right. Uh, more Japanese prints. Sorry, I'm not going to take a time there. So what I'm actually depicting here with that incorrect space is called isometric projection. And isometric projection, generally we see that in Eastern representations of space. So Eastern drawings and paintings and, you know, uh, prints of perspective. And what that is, is a kind of flatness um, and the parallel lines remain parallel. So, for instance, these lines on the floor in this Japanese woodblock don't appear to converge in space. They appear to remain completely parallel to each other. So that's isometric projection. It's actually an incorrect version of how we truly see, but it still can suggest space um, in order to, to, to play with it. So isometric projection, it, it tended to be used on um, early versions of maps. And it can be played with to deal with structure um, and invented spaces. So this is a Joseph Albers engraving. All right, I'm not sure why I have that. So another representation of foreshortening uh, in the illustration I suggested early verbally to you would be the branch in front of this water feature, which of course is gonna be very, very large and through use of stacking. We can also stack using just suggested space. So this is a sculpture that's actually cut in that shape and then painted on it are these suggested stacked spaces. This is a, a, an artist that passed away a few years ago from breast cancer, Elizabeth Murray. And she did these sort of cartoony uh, painting sculptures that are widely collected. Alex Katz plays with it as well. So. That brings us next to um, perceived transparency or value shift in overlap. So when we have two forms and we suggest that one is transparent, we will ultimately change the texture of that overlap. So an illustration of this would be um, uh, fruit in a bowl. And then of course, if we actually overlap those shapes in line. So the illusion is created when we avoid actually creating that suggestion of overlap. So transparency, as illustrated here, um, doesn't actually give us a really clear version of space, but what it does is it tells us what's behind what. So it gives us what's called equivocal space. So it's when two forms overlap, but both can still be seen. An equivocal space um, is generally at its purpose ambiguous. So it's a little confusing, but it's a shallow space. Does everybody understand what I mean by shallow space? Very near you versus very far. 
and shallow space can be suggested by something here. These little blocks tend to look like little drop shadows, right? Like they're very, very close to the picture plane. It's still a suggestion of space and dimensionality, but it is not a deep space like the one you see here. So flat space, shallow space, deep space, okay? All right, in conclusion, there are a good handful of ways to actually show depth, and we've talked about all of them today. We can show depth by playing with size. We can exaggerate size. We can overlap our forms. We can create a vertical location where we set the, our, our, van, our viewing point very, very high. It looks like we're hovering above. We can play with aerial perspective by making things in the background look hazy, out of contrast, and out of focus, or bluer. Then we can play with just linear perspective. So we can use one point, two point, or multiple point perspective in order to do that. And all of those terms that are new to us today, um, roped in are amplified perspective, multiple perspective, isometric perspective, open form versus closed form, and then using transparency. So I will 